Sox fans have Phil Fenway for all 81 regular season games for the first time in club history, extending the sellout streak to 145 games. A win in the fourth game would buy them one more night at Fenway. They got much more. But it goes and it's swung on and missed for strike three. In a seesaw battle, Derek Lowell was baffling the Bombers. The Sox had gone up by a run on a two-run single by David Ortiz in the fifth. And Boston has the lead. But the Yankees retook the lead with a series of infield singles, scoring two the very next inning. With the bases loaded and Derek Jeter at the plate, the New Yorkers had a chance to break it wide open. But Mike Timlin came through, inducing a ground out. Holding nothing back, Terry Francona called for Keith Folk to come in in the seventh, and he did, stifling the Yankees. Folk did it again in the eighth. And again in the ninth. And so he strikes out, and Keith Folk does a tremendous job to keep this a one-run game. The Sox closer had done all he could, but his team still trailed four to three in the bottom of the ninth. The New York Yankees were three outs away from once again crushing the pride of Red Sox Nation with an embarrassing sweep. And if ever the character of a unified team was needed, that time was now. Kevin Millar brought to Boston for his good eye, patient, and approach to the plate, batted. And there's life for the Red Sox. Hope lived. Terry Francona sent in pitch runner Dave Roberts. Everyone in Fenway Park and the millions watching at home knew he would go. Maury Wills popped in my head. And he was obviously a great Dodger and uh, he was a, a mentor of mine when my, when my days, uh, with my days in Los Angeles. And he always told me, he said, you know what? He said, you're gonna get an opportunity at some point in your career to do something very special. And, uh, and, and everyone in the ballpark knows you're gonna tr need to steal this base. You cannot let that opportunity that presents itself pass. It was a moment of truth, one of the biggest of the year, one of the biggest moments in Red Sox history. After the third pick over, he went to the plate, and I had a great jump, and uh, it was a good pitch for Jorge to throw on, and he made a pretty good throw, and uh, Gene made a pretty good tag, but uh, I didn't realize how close it was. But I look back now at the tapes, and uh, it was pretty dang close. The pitch high, the throw, the tag, set. That's exactly why Roberts was in the game. It was the steal of the century. The tension level rose. Bill Miller, who proved Rivera was mortal with his electrifying game-winning home run July 24th, faced the great closer once again. Up the middle, Roberts will come to the plate. The throw by Williams. Bill Miller has tied it. But thanks to one of the most tension-filled and inspiring one half innings of baseball ever, Hope and the Red Sox were alive. Both teams went quietly in the 10th, but in the 11th, the tension returned. Caught by the Diamond Cabrera, what a play! That threat was averted, but another arose as the Yankees loaded the bases again. The entire season was on the line as Curtis Lescani came in to face Bernie Williams. Williams flies it into shallow center field. Johnny Damon comes on, and this game's still tied. It's a 4-4 game, 12th inning. The relentless Yankees once again put a runner on second with just one out. Gets the out at first. Curtis Lascani got Tony Clark to fly out. Ramirez. Two out. Then the pesky Miguel Cairo stepped in with tension at a new high. Bottom of the 12th, Manny Ramirez single. Ramirez will start it with a hit. The game was five hours and two minutes old, the longest in American League championship history. It was cruelly cold and windy. It was 1.22 in the morning, and no one had left Fenway Park. They clung to what could be the final pitches of the season, keeping the faith. Sheffield, it's gone! The Red Sox 
Hawks have won it. This is a team that never give up. You, you guys know that that we we had a whole bunch of game coming from 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 behind like that and 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 play hard. If, even if we, if we lose the game, we still play the game right. Hope had returned to Fenway Park for at least one more day. With Pedro on the mound, Hopes rose even more. He held the Yankees to just a run until his 100th pitch in the sixth inning. Derek Jeter came through in the clutch with a three-run double, and it was 4-2 Yankees. Later, with two outs and the bases loaded, Hideki Matsui stepped to the plate. It looked like things could get worse. Into right field, hard hit. Nixon with a sliding catch. The game moved to the eighth, still 4-2 Yankees. The Sox were six outs from elimination, and this time in need of two runs. But with another huge homer, David Ortiz cut the lead to one. Just as he had the night before, Ortiz had come through, and just as they had the night before, Millar walked and Dave Roberts came in to run. He goes, swing and a line drive, base hit right center field. Roberts is on his way to third, he's in there standing. 2-0 to Jason. Swing and a high fly ball to center field. This should tie the game. Bernie Williams is under it. He's got a weak arm. He comes in, makes the catch. Roberts tags and scores, and we're tied at four. New life. But again, the Yankees look to end the Sox season. In the top of the ninth, Tony Clark shot into the right field corner, likely would have scored Ruben Sierra had it not bounced into the stand for a ground rule double. Keith Folk got out of the jam, and the Sox went quietly in the ninth. Though it would be a second straight extra inning affair at Fenway. In the 10th, it was Brunson Arroyo's turn to silence the Yankees bat, and he did. Jeter, A. Rod, and Sheffield went down 1 2 3. In the 11th, Mike Myers came in to face one batter, Hideki Matsui. Myers mowed him down, then gave way to Alan Embry, who whiffed two more. Sox relievers had picked up Pedro to throw five scoreless innings, and they weren't finished. The Sox threat in the 11th was doused by a double play. The bullpen was depleted, so on came Tim Wakefield, who would pitch every day if called on to do so. Wake got through the 12th, unscathed, but the Sox couldn't muster a run either. So they'd go to the 13th. The 13th inning began just as a cursed team would expect. The strikeout turned into a base runner when Wake's knuckler got away, and it would get even worse. Off the glove of Veritek again. His third pass ball in the inning. Was it possible the season would end again with Wakefield allowing a winning run? It seemed too cruel to be true. With two outs and season ending runs at second and third, Ruben Sierra threatened to end that streak and pin another excruciating loss on Wake and the Red Sox Nation. A 3-2. The inning is over. Veritek holds on. And Wakefield, through all of that, pitches a scoreless 13th inning. But the Sox went 1-2-3 in the bottom of the 13th, so Wake took the mound again for the 14th. No trouble this time, as he handled the Yankees in order. The game was well over five hours long when Johnny Damon walked with one out in the 14th. Then many walked. What followed was one of the most epic at-bats in Red Sox history. Ortiz puts it down the right field line, hooking foul. The 2-2. Two -two. Another foul. Tenth pitch of this at bat. Ortiz fights it off center field. Damon running to the plate, and he can keep on running to New York. Game six tomorrow night. The Yankees, I think, really have to think about who's their big puppy. At five hours and 49 minutes, it was the longest game in postseason history. Again, Red Sox Nation breathed a sigh of relief. 
on the field and off, the series had become a duel between those who believe miracles are possible against those who don't. The once slim odds of the believers were increasing. Back at Yankee Stadium, the weight of 86 years of futility rested on Kurt Schilling's right ankle. He'd undergone a unique surgery that stitched his loose ankle tendon in place. Schilling was in his classic postseason form, retiring nine of the first 10 hitters. A 2 2 now. Sierra strikes out, and that's the first strikeout of the night for Kurt Schilling. In the Red Sox fourth, with one run in, two on and two out. Fly ball twisting away from Matsui. He's on the run. It's over his head. And that ball up against the wall. It strikes the fence. Two runs will score. And now they're going to call it a home run. Let's see. That's over the fence. That should be a home run. We're going to get to know that fan's name. If they don't get this right, they got it right. Give them credit. And he just belted a three run homer to make it four to nothing, Boston. It was four to nothing, and Schilling was rolling at one point, retiring 12 of 13 hitters between the fourth and the seventh. He carried the Red Sox into the eighth with a four to one lead. On came Bronson Arroyo. Another clutch hit by Derek Jeter made it four to two, and Alex Rodriguez stepped in. Off the end of the bat, Arroyo. The ball gets loose. It's down the right field line. Jeter coming all the way around. It's a one run game. He swatted the ball out of the Royals' head. Now the umpires, for the second time tonight, are going to get together. And they're going to call him out. Now, they got the call right again, and they're going to bring Jeter all the way back to first base. Amazing. A Rod was out. Peter went back to first. Arroyo got the dangerous Gary Sheffield to pop out, and the threat was averted. In the ninth, a beleaguered Keith Folk walked two. But with two outs and two on, Folk reached deep just as the entire team had. 3 2 pitch. Swing and a miss. He threw a fastball by him. Game seven coming up tonight. We're all tied up, and it's for all the marbles tomorrow. In the second consecutive season, the Sox were one win at Yankee Stadium away from going to the World Series. Step right How can we have a game of the century every year? You know, I've been doing this 30 years. I can't remember anything like this. The Sox were loose for Game 7, and it showed. The pitch to David. Swing and a drive hammer deep to right field. Way back, and this ball is gone! Here's the pitch. Swing and a high drive to deep right. Back toward the corner, it goes. Sheffield looking up. Grand slam! Johnny Damon! While Boston launched rockets, Derek Lowe had the Yankees hitting rollers. 12 of the 18 outs he recorded were ground outs. Lowe gave up just one hit in six innings. New York would put a couple of runs on the board against Pedro Martinez in the seventh, but Mark Bellhorn countered. Mike Timlin and Alan Embry took over on the mound. Well, one more out, and that changes. Ground ball on the infield. And in the American League, Boston is second to none. The Red Sox have done it. They've pulled off the miracle. The most stunning comeback in baseball history. The Boston Red Sox become the first team ever to win a series. Went down three games to none. The 
That's why people got to keep their faith. We came all the way from the bottom, win the cup, now we're going to keep playing. Celebrating on the field and in the clubhouse, where the 2003 season had ended with sudden death, made this even more special. Just because something hasn't been done doesn't mean it can't be done. There was one more hurdle to overcome the St. Louis Cardinals. Red Sox Cardinals, folks. We have World Series souvenirs over here. Hats and t-shirts over here, folks. Sox got out of the gate fast in the first. Down the right field line, into the corner, it is fair and a three-run home run. Ortiz has done it again. Now, well, that's fair, inside third, down the line, that brings in another run. The lead grew to 6-2 to two in the third on singles by Johnny Damon and Orlando Cabrera. And Manny Ramirez ground out made it 7-2, to two. but in the fourth, three walks and some sloppy defense let the card back into the game. Bronson Arroyo replaced starter Tim Wakefield, helping the Sox cling to a 7-5 lead. But the cards kept coming, and back-to-back -back doubles in the sixth by Edgar Renteria and Larry Walker tied it at seven. In the seventh, Manny Ramirez broke the tie. Line shot center field, base hit, fell one to third, rounding. Edmonds a good arm, going off wide, and the run is in. David Ortiz was next. Possibly to turn a double play. Sharply, that one came up off Womack. It rolls in. But the 9 7 lead evaporated because on consecutive plays, errors by Manny led to run. It was tied again, this time at 9, and this time there were two runners on and the heart of the Cardinal lineup awaiting. Albert Pujols was walked to load the bases. Scott Rowland popped off, and the dangerous Jim Edmond had a shot at Folk with two outs. Got him looking on the inside corner, strike three, called. Relief, then more relief in the bottom of the inning. Flies that one to right. Did he hook it too much? It's down the line. It strikes the foul pole. It's gone. It's gone. A two-run homer for Bellhorn. And Boston leads again, 11 to 9. Folks stayed on to close it in the ninth, and Fenway's faithful celebrated once again have taken a 1-0 lead in the 2004 World Series. Game two was supposed to feature Kurt Schilling on the mound. I couldn't walk, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't move. I, I, I don't know what had happened, but I knew that when I woke up there was a problem. A stitch in his injured ankle was removed, the pain became bearable, and Schilling took the hill. He did the job again, throwing six innings, allowing just a run. The offense did all its damage with three two-out hits, the first a triple. Edmonds back, it's run way out there. That's going to be off the wall. That'll bring in Ramirez. That'll bring in Ortiz. Veritek into third. He slides in with a triple. The second, a double. Center field shot. Edmonds back. It's over his head. And the third, a single. Shot toward the green monster, high up it goes, and it is off the wall. Alan Embry, Mike Timlin, and Keith Pope threw the final three innings, and the Sox had a two game to none lead as they headed to St. Louis.
Rain poured down on the home of the National League champs, so Manny did some extra work indoors. In the top of the first, that work paid off. And in the bottom of the first, with the bases loaded and one out, Manny did it on defense. The Cardinals made another unusual base running gap in the third, a play that included a near perfect throw from D.H. David Ortiz, who was playing first base under National League rules. Base and a base running blunder of gigantic proportions. But the story of the game was the great Pedro Martini. He got better as the game went on, retiring the final 14 hitters he faced over seven innings. Swing and a miss, he struck him out. As a free agent to be, the proud Dominican dominated. In his first World Series start, Pedro looked like the three-time Cy Young Award winner the Red Sox had grown to love. With Mike Timlin and Keith Folk closing the door on the card yet again, the 2004 Red Sox were on the brink of becoming world champions. And they are one victory away from ending 86 years of pain. Game four marked the first lunar eclipse during a fall classic game. And when Johnny Damon let off, it was clear the earth, the sun, the moon, and stars were finally aligned the Red Sox way. The Red Sox score first again. Derek Lowe, relegated to the bullpen to start the postseason, picked a fine time to throw another great game. Molina strikes out. It was still 1-0 in the third when Trot Nixon got the green light on 3-0. This ball's off the wall. With low going seven fantastic shutout innings, generations of Red Sox fans watched in nervous awe as the unthinkable was happening. Arroyo, Embry, and Folk kept the shutout intact. The sweet sounds of the final out are already etched in the minds of those who dreamed of this, kept the faith, and believed in miracles. Swing and a ground ball, stabbed by Folk. He has it. He underhands the first. And the Boston Red Sox are the world champions. For the first time in 86 years, the Red Sox have won baseball's world championship. Can you believe it? <laughs> what a great team achievement. The wait is over, my friend. The wait is over. The best feeling is going to be able to see our fans when we go back home. The celebration went on inside and out for more than an hour. Thousands who had made the trek to St. Louis to witness history flocked to the edge of the field to say thanks for the title, thanks for the memories, thanks for overcoming the odds, and thanks for never giving up. They waited for hours at the team hotel to see their favorite Sox board the buses to the airport. By 3.30 in the morning, they were in the air on the way to Boston. Yeah! At Logan Airport, and on the streets, just after sunrise in Boston, the celebration continued as baseball's holy grail was finally delivered to Fenway Park. In the end, some would say it was destiny. Others would say it's a miracle. For the first time since 1918, the Red Sox were champs of the baseball world. Impossible.